Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where I'm bringing this show to you from the sunny West Midlands here in the UK. The leaves are coming back on the trees, flowers and butterflies are coming out. Isn't it funny how the weather can affect our moods? But I know you all listen in over a hundred different countries out there, and some, like my friends in California, don't really have seasons. What's that like? A life without seasons. As always, send your thoughts about anything over to me at at techblogwriter at outlook.com. Now, I am a man that since the age of five was told I'm easily distracted, so I better get the show back on track. And today I've got Rick Hall joining me on the podcast, and he's been working in the industry for 30 years and is the CEO of a company called Agility Corporation. And Agility Corporation is the only next generation analytics management tool set designed specifically to empower analytics teams to take advantage of those top analytic platforms. And Rick has led the development of over a dozen software products and taken several companies from early stage to eventual sale. So today I've invited him on the podcast to talk about the evolution and current state of analytics technology and the processes and technology companies need to succeed with in those analytic programs. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to the US where Rick Hall is waiting to speak with us now. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Yeah. Hey, Neil, thanks for having me. So, you know, Rick Hall and I'm the CEO of Agility Corporation. I've been in the analytics space and starting software companies for a lot of the past uh, 30 years. Um, So kind of a long time. And, uh, you know, what we do is we uh, help companies really implement analytics and uh, have a set of tools for that. And I've kind of done everything from, you know, build big corporate analytics systems with lots of artificial intelligence to, uh, you know, to using data for just daily activity. And like you said that, you have been working in the industry for 30 years and currently the CEO at the Agility Corporation. But a question that I often like to ask guests when they first come on the podcast is, can you remember where your love of technology came from and and what it was that put you on this path? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, I think I've been interested in technology since I was really a kid. Um, And uh, maybe in part because, you know, kind of my dad, was interested in, you know, kind of technology and building things. And, you know, kind of, he caught me interested. I started kind of working with software really even in high school. I was playing around with computers. I played around with them in college. But when I got out of college, I was actually doing work in a nonprofit sector. And uh, I had a, you know, little nonprofit I was working with. And I kept trying to convince them we should automate our membership. And, you know, finally the director, you know, just turned to me and said, oh, just shut up and do it. (laughs) Uh, And uh, so that kind of started me on a path of, you know, first of all, just kind of automating some basic stuff about membership. But that quickly got into this question of, you know, what separates good members from bad members? Who's going to renew? Who isn't going to renew? And I, you know, so that kind of those kind of questions uh, it turned out to be data questions. I didn't really know at the time that that was going to trigger me onto this path of this intersection of, you know, kind of how decisions are made and data that facilitates that. And that's kind of, you know, where I've been ever since. Love that. And of course, right here in 2021, there's a lot of focus on analytics technology and the importance of data-driven decisions, but it's not always been this way. So can I ask that you tell me more about the evolution and the current state of analytics technology from your point of view? Yeah. So I think that, uh, uh, I mean, to some extent, I think probably to, you know, if we, I defined analytics as using data to drive outcomes, right? So it's pretty broad definition. Um, and I think that that's kind of been part of computer technology from the early days. But a lot of 
uh, early focus of computing has been around automation of tasks, right? So we want to do things more effectively because we're going to take out a bunch of human labor and put in computers to do it. And, you know, you could kind of think of that as spurring a lot of what, you know, computing has been about. Um, but that set of activity, it turns out, has produced a whole bunch of data, right? You know, so the data that's come out of the automation of activity uh, has led to, you know, people thinking about, well, that data can be used to improve that process or that activity and other things. And I think that kind of analytics kind of grew out of that. Well, gee, first we're going to automate, and then we automate and we figure out, well, there's a bunch of data. We can use that data to do things more effectively. And, you know, and of course now it's, it's recognized broadly. But I think that it went from, you know, early focus on automation to this you know, kind of era of corporate data warehousing is a very centralized approach to using data uh, to, I think, the world we're in now where it's, you know, kind of data is everywhere uh, and empowering people throughout an organization to use data uh, is, uh, is where, you know, we see most of our customers and I think many, many organizations are thinking that way um, today. And there'll be a lot of businesses that are still trying to find their way and, and make the right decisions. But from your point of view, can you tell those those business leaders that could be listening to our podcast today anywhere in the world, the kind of processes and the technology that they're going to need to succeed with analytics programs? Sure. I mean, I think that so for a long time, you know, we had this focus on what I think would be described as the corporate data warehouse. It's a very centralized, engineered approach to, you know, solving problems. Um, and I think that, you know, today we see ourselves in a world that we define as collaborative analytics, where we want to empower people in the business to use data. Um, and to do that, we think of that journey as kind of first a foundation, which is kind of just democratize access to data. We think that's kind of the starting point. Uh, as opposed to the old days, the starting point was we're going to go off and build a warehouse and we'll, we'll be back to you in a year with the data. Today, it's like, okay, wherever the data is, let's democratize access to it, give people the ability to use it. Um, now, that does require some basic technology of, you know, kind of you got to figure out where you're going to put it. Uh, in today's world, uh, you know, there's a bunch of technology that's cloud resident, that's great places to put data, and they're very flexible and scalable, and so you don't have to buy, you know, massive computing up front. I think organ most organizations have kind of addressed that or are addressing that. So if you assume you've got kind of this open technology strategy around using data or, or gathering data, then you democratize it. That's the first thing in our world. The second stage really is, uh, you know, kind of building a structure on top of that where you get to, you know, kind of reuse and sharing and, you know, kind of more and more people are creating assets from that data that you're going to build on. Um, and then finally, a third phase off of that is then really turning data into the kind of fuel of your entire enterprise. But um, rather than doing what we would have done 10 years ago to say, I'm going to go build a corporate data warehouse, uh, we would say, figure out where your data is um, and you know, start by giving your broad organization access uh, and push innovation out to them. Uh, and we think that's where, you know, kind of really leading companies are no longer trying to do this in a very centralized way. They're really trying to kind of distribute data across their org. And I'm curious, where does Agility fit in all this? And for people that are maybe listening and hearing about Agility for the first time, could you possibly expand on how your software is going to support these efforts just to bring everything that we're talking about to life here? Yeah, sure. So, you know, kind of the, you know, we're not a data platform, right? So there's uh, all the big cloud vendors uh, and even a lot that aren't have databases that store this data and perform calculations. And, you know, that's great. And they're super performant and they're getting better and better all the time. What we do is we provide tools that sit on top of those data platforms that are used by both end users, so business people who need to access data, we make it easy for them to access and manipulate that data. And uh, engineers who build the really complicated data structures 
um, also use our tools. So we really sit as end user tooling for both the business team and the engineers to collaborate uh, on building, you know, capabilities. And then we have those tools that sit on top of, you know, these data platforms, right? So we're not a data platform, we're an end user tool for analysts and engineers to collaborate. And you are, as you said at the very beginning of the podcast, someone that's worked in the tech industry for 30 years. And again, I'm curious, if you look back at the lessons you've learned over that 30 years from multiple software startups, is there anything in particular that you've learned or or, or things that you've applied uh, with uh, Agility today? Yeah, so I think that, you know, kind of, uh, it kind of goes to the same topic of kind of engineer. Uh, versus, you know, kind of what I think of as more evolving. So, you know, kind of in the early days of software, and I think that for a lot of people thinking about how they would start a company, uh, it would always be about, I've got an idea and I'm going to go off and do it. And then when I'm done, I'll take it to, uh, you know, the customers and they're going to love it, right? Uh, and I think that what was happening was changed a lot is, Instead of focusing on the answer, we focus on the outcome that we're trying to deliver. So this, instead of thinking about I'm inventing X, you think about I'm going to deliver value of Y. And then your approach to delivering that value, which may be what your original idea was, is something that you test and iterate on as opposed to go off and build in a vacuum. And uh, so I think the the most important thing that I've learned is to, hey, you know, an, an idea is just a hypothesis about value. And I'm going to go take that idea and I'm going to figure out how I can test that idea as quickly as possible. Um, and uh, if I don't have exactly right, I'll, you know, I'll iterate on it till I get something that produces the value that I'm trying to deliver. And so I would say the most important thing I've learned in my career is to kind of transition from the idea to the value and thinking about value and how you iterate on value. Uh, and I think that's important for developing products, for developing companies. And I think that it's it's really at the heart of how we uh, use data today in analytics. Love that. And we will have many startup founders listening all over the world. Uh, many will be at the very beginning of their journey. So as someone that's uh, learned so many lessons on your own, what are the biggest challenges and rewards of being a, a software entrepreneur, would you say? Well, I mean, I think that just in being an entrepreneur in, in general, right, you really kind of have to be, you know, driven by, you know, what you're trying to do, the value I think, again, the value, the outcome you're trying to create. And, uh, you know, the, you, we all hear the great stories, like the Google guys who started up this company and, you know, it became super successful. But, you know, in most companies, uh, there's ups and downs, right? And if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to be comfortable with the idea that when things are difficult, uh you're going to be the person to double down and take the risk to keep things rolling, right? So, you know, kind of everything we learn about our own finances and, you know, kind of life is, well, when things are riskiest is when you're supposed to kind of spread the risk out and try to, you know, avoid uh, things going wrong. But as an entrepreneur, when things are riskiest, you have to double down because if you don't, you know, nobody else is going to, right? And uh, so you have to be kind of comfortable with uncertainty. Um, but I think the, the foundation of it is if you have some people that you're trying to deliver some value to and you really focus on them and the value that you're going to deliver and you figure out what it takes to deliver that value and you listen to them, that you can build a business you know, that way. And I think that it won't always go as fast as you want, but, you know, I think that, uh, you know, there's lots of stats out there about how many businesses fail, but I think a lot of times it's just like the willingness to stick with, uh, this idea and this value until you get there. Now, sometimes it's the idea itself, you know, people get obsessed by the idea and the idea doesn't actually solve the problem. 
And I think that's a mistake that everybody should avoid. Uh, and uh, it may be hard when you have some inspiring idea. Um, but, you know, beyond that, it's, you know, think about the customer and value and be prepared to iterate till you get it right. And, uh, uh, but go into it knowing that um, it might be risky at times and you have to be prepared for that. And if you're not prepared for that, then, you know, probably being an entrepreneur is the wrong place for you. And I also think that you could have the best technology in the world and the best solution, but the future success of it will be determined by adoption and getting people on board to buy it. So are there any tips that you could share to listeners on on how they can sell software, whether it be big or small? Yeah, I mean, I think that things have changed a lot in how we sold software, right? So it used to be we would have you know, hire a bunch of really experienced enterprise salespeople and they would call on the chief executive officer, or the head of technology, and you know, paint this grand vision and take a long time to convince them, months and months of sales cycles, you know, before they'd ever get to a point, but they'd eventually buy. And then they would go and implement it, right? And we we go the completely opposite right now. So our approach, and I think that this is now increasingly common is we give our software away. Uh, we have a free product and people can download it and try it. And if they like it, great. And they can adopt it. And if they adopt it, then there's a paid version and then there's, you know, kind of more premium versions uh, that go from there. So this kind of free adoption model, get it out there, get people using it, learn from their usage of it. Uh, and then when you have got value established, uh, get them to pay. And uh, uh, it's a whole different approach to selling software. And I think, frankly, not just software, but lots of things are sold in this kind of freemium type way. And, uh, and in our case, also with a subscription model. So, you know, kind of in addition to starting off free, you don't have to pay for it all at once, right? You subscribe to it and you pay for it as long as you're getting value out of it. And, you know, so that really, you know, kind of aligns the sale with uh, the value you're delivering. And I think that that uh, is just a way better model for, you know, for software and for businesses, any business that can get, can achieve that uh, kind of, premium and subscription model. I think it's a great model. I think that almost all software is, is either being subscription with or without a free model. Um, that's, that's the foundation today. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And it's so so much forward, more forward thinking than sneakily locking someone into another five years on their contract like the old days, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it used to be, I mean, you know, kind of, you, you don't even hear this term so much anymore, but used to hear a lot in enterprise software about the term shelfware. Yeah. And, uh, you know, shelfware was some big piece of enterprise software, got sold to some senior executive. Uh, and because, you know, they're the only people who could pay for these things, or millions of dollars in many cases, uh, and uh, or pounds, right? You know, sterling or whatever the currency, right? You know, the uh, but the, the fact of the matter is that then the vision didn't turn out to work for people who are actually doing the job. Uh, and so it sat on the shelf, right? But the, the company paid for it all up front. So they already paid the X million dollars. Uh, and now they've got this piece of software on the shelf. And, you know, so it's a subscription model and one that lets you start easily, easy, easier way in for a free or a very low cost, you know, kind of version um, before you increase your subscription uh, completely realigns that in a really uh, effective way i think for both parties the seller and the buyer 100 percent with you on that and if we look to the future what's next for agility is there anything else you can share about the road ahead for you guys or or any emerging tech trends that particularly excite you and that you're monitoring closely sure i mean for us uh the really interesting thing is around uh powering people who are not technical to use data more effectively. So, uh, you know, our tools have some technical capabilities and some, I'll call them semi-technical capabilities. And we're really focused on saying, well, 
we want to make it easier and easier for somebody who's not a technical person to be able to use data to get to what they want to. And so thinking about, you know, experiences that don't require writing code that are very intuitive, uh, that's that's really where a lot of our work is. And we're having a, you know, kind of interesting time there. And, you know, I think that ties to this whole, you know, kind of empowering people in the business. So you think about businesses and, you know, kind of, I almost kind of think of this, this, this layer of Excel uh, that sits on top of everybody's corporate data assets because, you know, kind of uh, nobody could give the data the way they needed to to people in the business. So everybody just used Excel and they did whatever they could do, um, you know, kind of empowering those people to use data more effectively is is kind of where we're at. Um, and I think what's interesting as well is, which I think goes with this empowerment way more broadly than the kind of thing we're doing is, you know, kind of driving decisions down to, you know, smaller, almost independent teams that are empowered to do things as opposed to kind of the classic hierarchical model. We have big customers, really big ones, who are, uh, you know, who be well-known leaders in the analytics space. And you can't actually find a head of analytics in those companies um, because they've pushed things so far down and distributed decision making into independent teams that can work in kind of small squads uh, on their own uh, to get things done. And I think that kind of is a really interesting trend uh, in technology and in business about small team independent autonomy and empowerment uh, as a, as an objective to structure. Incredibly cool what you're doing there. And for anyone listening that would like to find out a little bit more information about the work that you're doing at Agenity or even contact your team if they're left with any questions, in particular if they want to understand their data and not technical and have been intimidated by the space before, what's the best way of doing that? Sure. I mean, so, you know, you can reach out to us at agenity.com is our website. And people can go down there and, you know, if they want to try out a software, you can download it and test it yourself. Right. If you're, you know, kind of non-technical and maybe even that's a little intimidating, you know, we have a support email. Reach out to us. We'll happily tell you what, you know, how to do what we're doing. And, you know, like I said, our focus is on taking people like that and making it easier and easier for them. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. We're also on LinkedIn. And, you know, I'm always open to uh, to people who reach out to me, you know, kind of, I had a lot of people help me on my entrepreneurial journey. Uh, and I'm always open to, uh, you know, to talk to others. So, you know, happily uh, take questions or input from, from people who are thinking about this space. Well, one of the things I always say on this daily tech podcast is to try and well, one of the reasons I started it was to try and talk about real world problems, how we can solve them, but in a language that everyone can understand, not just the techies in the corner. And there's a line you used a few minutes ago about one of the big things that inspires you is empowering people who are not technical to understand their data. That combined with your story and sharing the lessons that you've learned, incredibly uh, valuable to people listening and myself. So uh, a big thank you for taking the time to come on here and share that with me today. Yeah, Neil, I'm happy to do it. And, you know, like I said, you know, uh, people can happily go check out our stuff and if we can help. That's great. I think Rick is one of life's good guys and a real pleasure to speak with today about the processes and technology companies need to succeed with their analytic program. Not to mention, of course, how Agility Software supports those efforts and the lessons from multiple software startups and how he applied those lessons to, uh, to Agility too. But I am more of a words, more than a numbers guy. So for all you listening out there that are passionate about analytics technology, Please, this is the moment where you step up and email me your stories, insights and comments by simply emailing me techblogwriter at outlook.com or pop by my website techblogwriter.co.uk. But it's time for me to take my office outside, soak up some vitamin D while editing this episode together. And I'll join you all again tomorrow. So I hope you'll meet me. I'll be the guy with a big pair of headphones and a microphone <laughs> on a boom arm. But I'll see you then. So a big thank you for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. 
Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.